Welcome to the Body Science Podcast. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health related condition. Welcome to Body Science HQ, the world of fit, happy, healthy. And today we've got Byron from the Brumbies. How are you, mate? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me along. Nice. I'm sitting here with Mark, our dietitian as well. How are you, Mark? Very good, Greg. Very good, Byron. This is, this is an honor. I'm excited. Well, that'd be a rugby thing, wouldn't it? It's totally a rugby thing. The accent's thing. giving a little bit away there. Totally a rugby union. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, this yeah. one's going to be good. We're going to have a chat about Byron's background, but what him and I had a chat about a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was really cool, was how culture plays a role in rehabilitation and the process that around, around athletes there. I think that's a topic that we just haven't touched before. And culture and rehab, I'll be honest, Byron, I had to run off and look it up. Love culture, but culture rehab together was, you know, it's above my pay grade. But mate, before we hook into this, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself for those people out there that haven't listened? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a great question because it gets you really thinking about how you how you got into this game. You know, you get a little bit retrospective after you've been for a wee while. So I guess, you know, I started, uh, my first degree was in psychology and I kind of wound my way through uh, sport and exercise science and those kind of things, did a little bit of other, other study and work in and around that for a couple of years and then kind of a little bit of a early mid-career change. I went back and studied physiotherapy and loved it straight away, obviously. And then I was kind of a failed athlete myself. So it was kind of nice to get in and around it and pretend to be um, pretend to be a sports person again. And then after a couple of years of working the cold sidelines in Canberra, ended up with the Brumbies. Had a great time through there. We had a really interesting year around 2000 and maybe 10, 11, 12. Um, Jake White, who won the World Cup with South Africa in 2007, and Dean Benson put together a fantastic um, high-performance team and, and playing group through uh, 2012, 13. And we were lucky enough to make finals and beat the British and Irish Lions, which was just a really cool era to cut my teeth in as a young you know, sports practitioner. And I, I pretty quickly worked out that physiotherapy was very one small component of, of a high-performance unit and that you could actually get a lot of gains in the performance space, the nutrition space, recovery space. You know, so holistically looking at people, and it wasn't something that I forced, it just it came to me. I found I had better results when I looked at the holistic athlete. And so we stayed at, I stayed at Brumbies for a few years and, and did some more training in some different areas. Um, upskilled myself in, in around strength and conditioning, which is really really important and not that I wanted to go down that track specifically but just to be able to speak the language of some of those great coaches who we had at the time who I thought were making building amazing athletes really and then lucky enough to spend a little bit of time in the in the UK I went over and worked in the premiership um, which really opened, opened my eyes to football in the northern hemisphere and the, the culture and the religion that it is over there <laughs> uh, and then then just recently came back out out to the Brumbies um, and uh, I'm in a role as a head of performance health here at the moment which um, is great it's diverse I get to work with the super rugby team but also um, help out in a around the different programs at the Brumbies. And um, yeah, it's look, can I just say, it's a, it's a great organisation to be a part of down here. It's a, you know, from you know, from the people in the front office, we, we take try and take great care of our community and, you know, the, the kids coming through and trying to build our systems, which you guys might have, you might have noticed is this big focus on rebuilding Australian rugby from the ground up. So yep. I'll see the Brumbies. Brumbies doing good things in that space. And I guess the, the final piece of the puzzle is a PhD I'm doing in, in concussion. So mm. I guess you know, everyone gets to this point in their career and they want to give a little bit back. And that's, I've, I've seen so many guys retire with you know, ongoing concussive symptoms that I think um, if I can do a little bit of that space while I'm still in the game, then um, all the better. Mate, you've touched on concussion. It's a big thing for me. I've got a lot of mates that play footy. Mm. What can you actually do in a contact sport around concussion, like in, in all honesty, in your position and, and the power you've got and the role that you're holding? What can yeah. you actually bring to that? Yeah, we're going down the rabbit hole here. Yeah. This, could be three, this could be a three-hour podcast. <laughs> Great question. I, I think the, the first thing you've got to do is understand that you can't do nothing. Yep. You know, like it's a big problem. It's everywhere. So what are the tools we have? And, and my particular interest is in, it's called concept mapping. So the first thing we did was go to the whole, every layer of the game, ask the CEO what they think of concussion, ask the strength conditioning, the nutritionist. What does everyone kind of think about how we can actually prevent concussion? Everyone's got different ideas, yeah, right? That. But we're kind of going at it in different areas. Um, so some great tertiary work in the concussion space in terms of supplements. Um, so we'd certainly use those once players have been concussed. A little bit of evidence coming around um, taking it as a um, pre-concussion. So just as a general dose, creatine being one of those things. Yep. Um, and then on top of that, my interest is in the kinematics of head contact. So perhaps we can't stop concussions, but maybe can we make the game a little bit safer or make our training a little bit more specific by knowing what sort of forces are going through the head um, when players get hit. So we've got uh, little mouth guards that have got accelerometers and gyroscopes in them that tell us how much force essentially goes through the brain when, they, when they're impacted. So, you know, it's a labour of love um, and it's, you know, it's something that I want to use on the sideline uh, a little bit more. As a, as a, as a pitch side clinician, I want more tools to be able to rely on, give me more quantitative information. Greg, um, w- what I see a lot when I watch the union is as soon as the players go off for a HIA, a head injury assessment, th- they're not coming back on. 
Uh, you, pretty much very seldomly do we see them come back on. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, mate, yeah. I guess I think so. Well, we're being more cautious, aren't we? You mm. know, like we're yeah. really on the side of caution, which I think I think's the right thing. You know, and it's evolved a lot. You know, we, we started in... I started in 2010, 11, um, when we didn't have um, the videos and the time off the field, the HA wasn't around, and then that's kind of evolved. And we just need to keep evolving, you know. Mm-hmm. Like the tech's getting better, you know. The, the work that you guys do is improving; it's getting better in all in all parts of our field. And we've got to keep. We we just got to make sure that we're you know maximising um, our strategies to protect players as much as we can, right? And mate, is, is it seen as a negative culture if someone does go off to from a team of sport where winning is everything? I mean, that sport. How did how did the team see when someone goes off on a HIA is it a bit like when people are dieting and they get like they eat food and they go I shouldn't have eaten that and this and that do do you still see a lot of that in sport because I mean HIA is pretty new in sport when you look at like the the uh, rugby's been around for what how many years like I couldn't even guess Uh, since Springboks won it in 95 I think that's all (laughs) I think that's when it began (laughs) yeah that snuck in didn't it oh Oh, we can edit that that shit out that was was beautifully done yeah it was it was nice like for, yeah. from a cultural perspective, is it? And I mean, you, it was really interesting what you said before. Like I asked the CEO, the dietitians, the strengths, the, the staff. And I mean, as a CEO, obviously of, of a business as well, you you want your employee to feel safe and to feel like that we're doing everything we can in that space. But you've also come reporting time. You're reporting on profitability and wins and all the things that you do. H- how mm. did the cultural aspect of, I mean, obviously I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here with any answers or that, but did you see a, a, a very diverse flow of answers in relation to what people thought that was? Oh, yeah. Yeah. For the extremes, right? So mm. most, you know, you can imagine most people when you canvass opinion, um, you know, you're interested in improvement, more funding in the research. Everyone knows that complex the problem is and yeah. everyone knows that we need to coexist together you know we don't want to see the abolishment of, of contact sport there's a lot of good things to come from absolutely. it absolutely you know in, in terms of uh, a healthy society so you know no i don't think anybody wants that but there's certainly you know we need to know more about it one of the probably big pushes would be uh, along with research is just having more education for players and staff like it's not that someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes when they say no mate i'm fine it's my neck it's my neck um check my neck and yeah. they're actually being concussed you go back and look at the video and go oh geez they've been they've been snoozing yeah um it's not a deliberate thing part of concussion is confusion um and, and they're high level athletes they know exactly what to say at the right time i've been out to players that are, have had a you know a, a clear concussion and they will know exactly where they are like that they're like, what do you yeah. want to know? Tell me, what, tell me what you need to know. Ask me questions. Let's go. And uh-huh. you're like, okay, maybe they are okay. And then you go off and see a video. And it's like, oh, God. Um, but, you know, <laughs> thankfully, we're trying to put safeguards in the game that prevent us, um, you know, players returning to the pitch and all this kind of thing when they are concussed. Uh, so it's about safeguarding them, isn't it? Exactly. And are you um mm. are you working one-on-one with athletes in relation to how they tackle, how they how they hit the ball up, how that – like, are we, are we looking at that level? Because, I mean, you watch a lot of the mm. footy and you see, you see someone sent off for a high hit or a shoulder and you – go well that guy was coming down the angle wasn't right or you know we're all couch warriors from my end do you spend a lot of time and a lot because obviously there's Mm. video analysis for athletes they can watch a lot of video these days do do you look at that and the way people do things you know even the way they fend the way they they go into anything any positional play yeah definitely so there's a couple of ways you can attack that problem. So you can you can look at everyone that's had a concussion. So yeah. maybe over the course of a season, you might have um, you know 25 concussions per your team of athletes. You can go back wow. and look at each athlete and go, there's a commonality to that. So, you know, they their their footwork wasn't where it needed to be. They dropped their head under fatigue and they they got a hip on the side of their head. That that's one reasonably common. So that it can be a, or it can be a technical problem. So a player might be going in wrong sided. Yep. Or they could just be getting a little bit caught late. Someone steps into them. So an unexpected or an unanticipated um, event. So the the player comes in and someone tackles from the other side and they weren't expecting him to come on on that particular angle at them so that's that's certainly one piece the other bit we're looking at guys would would be pouring time into neck strengthening so you know being able to stiffen up that scaffold between the head and trunk yeah okay. is a real growth area for a couple of research pockets around the world and i think there's i think there's tremendous um you know capability and, and ability to add to what we know in terms of preventing things potentially down the tracker why do we see so few players wearing headgear is that something that's on the way out mm. No, I mean, if, if you're talking, yeah, the the problem with headgear, um, we, we we get nice and deep, which is great. So, um, a lot of a lot of concussive episodes we think comes from rotational, which you're not going to have an impact. So most of the the direct blows to the head, they might stop some bruising and and hard tissue injuries to the skull, um, but you're not going to stop the shearing on the axons, which we think is part of the injury process. So those 
those nerves get twisted in particular directions as the head gets rotated um, mm. with the contact. So the head gear is not going to stop that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still there's still depth of research to be done there, but mm. the right where we are at the moment, it's it's effective at protecting lacerations, um, mm. etc. But not not effective or not shown to be um, beneficial to reducing concussion mm. incidents. Okay. And mate, is anyone looking at? Obviously, you just talked about helmets, or you know, the NFL they say that the helmets don't do a lot except make them feel more confident. Mm. Uh, is there going to be a lot of neck protection in the future? Are we looking in that space? Like, is is the athlete in the next 20 years going to look very different running on the field to what they look now? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I'm interested in getting your opinions on. So there's there's a school of thought that says we need to have less contact during training or delaying the training age. Yep. Um, you might have seen that in the popular press around around delaying uh, introduction of um, your kiddies until 12, 14, 16. And I think that's an area of, you know, that's a, that's a great um, conversation piece in and of itself. So I guess what you have to, what are you actually doing to those kids by delaying their motor learning until they're um, pubescent or prepubescent, bigger bodies, they're learning how to do things for the first time and they've got no idea or no ability to control their arms and legs and heads in space. Yep. So that's why that'll be really interesting to see what that does to the to the population of contact sport is that are we going to have more bigger bodies running into each other that now don't know what to do because they haven't practiced those skills from early ages. Yep. So I, I think that's a fascinating space. And mm. where policy has been changed, right? Like we're going down there. Um, you know, we're dropping tackle highlights, um, mm. all sorts of things all the time. So it's like, okay, this will be interesting to see the landscape in a few years' time when we pour back over that the research and go, gee, that was effective or it went the other way. That's so, going to be as big an issue as doping mm. in the future, isn't it? Like, uh, I don't want to oh, pick yeah. on South Africa, but mm. you know, you could very easily have little things going on the back ground that we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to talk about when I was I'm playing at school. I'm going to let that one hang there. <laughs> we, we wore shoulder pads always, and it was so exciting to, you know, wear the big shoulder pads, make it look like you had big adultoids at, at school. And, <laughs> shoulder and, pads. Uh, I remember I had shoulder pads too, actually. When I see the guys, the footage, like at half time, and they're in the change rooms and they're changing their shirts, and they're, they're strapping, first of all, everywhere. Yeah. So I want to talk about yeah. the strapping is interesting. But then I don't see shoulder pads. Is that true? <laughs> no, uh, there's, there's certainly rigging. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I would, I would have grown up in an era where there was, um, you know, everyone was wearing their, their shoulder pads and that sort of stuff. But exactly. no, not, not a lot anymore. Mm. Um, there's, there's regulations around the thickness that you can wear. Oh. Um, some guys do. Some guys, it's too hot, uncomfortable, you know. Yeah, yeah, but Mark, fair comment. Um, not something I've looked a bunch into, but yeah, yeah there's, um, yeah, no, I don't see a lot of Because you go in with the shoulder to tackle. There used to be the padding and now it's, okay. Well, can we mention? I have no <laughs> idea. There must be something in that. Can we talk about the, the strapping? Is, is that does that fall under your? Are you in charge of that? And how? Yeah. I, I mean, every person on the field's got strapping somewhere, right? We're in the wrong exactly. business. Yeah, the tape no, business. They do. yeah. <laughs> the higher up you go, so the wall the wallabies with the salt rabbit, the wallabies would have the highest yeah. amount in Australia per player. Yeah. And then as you kind of work your way down to the sixteen year olds, thankfully they come in, they don't ever know what it is. So okay. it's not until we corrupt them and start putting strapping. Well, they see the other guy getting strapping, so like that'll hold my shoulder together. Yeah. Um, you know, well look, this is a nice thing we want to rehab, right? Hopefully, if we do our rehab have so well um by the time they come back to their return to play they're um they're kind of humming and they don't need to rely on external but as a little top-up confidence i think the mechanical properties of tape do offer the joint something okay mm. interesting mm. mate we uh, we got on here to talk about the culture at the, uh, at the brumbies and especially around rehab and the approach injury recover. do you want to do you want to define for us here i'm going off topic to where we were there but mate just stepping back to the brumbies how does rehab protocols and the approach to injury recover work with team culture like that's the topic that when you're talking to me that was a, a really cool piece that you love like how, how does rehab and culture come together when we're talking about a sporting team hmm. yeah an area of passion of mine mate over a, a long period of time um when i go and talk to different physios at different clubs to try and learn from them i certainly um you know watch what they do culture is one of those great things is that yeah it's not kind of what they talk about it's what you see yeah um you know you can you can you can see it you can smell it you know good clubs when you kind of see them and i think a rehab culture gives you a nice microcosm of general beer culture for the rugby department yep and then the organization beyond that i really see them as being um reflective and um of, of everything that kind of goes on within a space so you know to to kind of delve a little bit deeper into it. Um, um, play gets injured. What does it look like as soon as they're injured? Are people around them? Are they overwhelmed with support, which is what we need in a really traumatic period of life? Um, what support do you put around them in those first hours after the injury? Um, what do you put around them in the next 24, 48, uh, et cetera, hours down the track yep. to know that they feel like they're still part of it? Because it's a huge thing, right? It's um, you, know, you guys, I'm sure, have had injuries in your, in your career. Um, and it's really, you feel separated. You feel really divorced from the, the safety of the group. Yep. Um, and you question whether you're going to get back, even with minor injuries. So there's a huge, and I guess I lean a little bit on my, my 
kind of brief delvings into psychological study and that sort of thing to, to understand the psyche of someone when they're taken out of a taken out of a group. And you see that when players retire, um, and even when staff retire, to be honest, we're so um, built into schedules and living. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, seven o'clock I straight up, eight o'clock I have supplements, nine o'clock I gym, ten o'clock I want. Yeah, so you get this schedule for your life, right? Yep. And then it becomes really hard if you've done that for you know any amount of time. Let's call it a ten year career. Um, some are a lot longer, some are shorter. But if you've been institutionalised like that, it becomes really hard to divorce yourself from that. And it's a similar sort of concept when you injure yourself and you're going to rehab. You're kind of you're a bit lost. So giving people purpose um, is a huge thing, and having them centric to it. I mean, that's that's kind of 101. Um, I can sit back and say, look, this hammy, this is what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to give it this much strength. Um, we'll make sure we get supplementation taken at the right time. We'll recover, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What you have to tap into is what that person needs and wants at that particular time, yeah. and they'll have ideas about what they want to do. They want to get better in a different way. They want to uh, improve their game um, in this particular facet. They love the coaches. You know, I, I think a lot of rehab people forget that. Is that coaches are brilliant at tapping into people. Yeah. You know, I'm a support. I'm a support person around it but they really love talking to coaches the people that they're going to pick them in the team they want to know how does the coach want me to get better it's a really special relationship mm. if you guys have kind of watched it close it's like you know I'm so peripheral to that how that player is going to get better and have a good career um, it's that coach player relationship they delve into it and the, the great players I see soak soak as much as they can a guy called Dave Pocock who's a pretty oh, yeah. fair player mm. you know he would just he was a sponge you know mm. like he was a great player had an amazing natural capacity and ability um, but you know he would just stoke up information he had a thirst for it and the, you know, the players that I kind of see with that attention attention to detail to go and ask for more we had a, a guy called Laurie Fisher um, yeah, who recently yeah. retired um, and he was unbelievable you know like his, his knowledge of game and want to get better after 35 years of coaching is oh guys it's something that I really admired and um, yeah we'll miss him around the Brumbies but yeah, life goes on yeah, exactly. I'm glad you mentioned David Pocock. Yeah, he's absolute legend of the game and um, obviously been a huge trooper for the Brumbies over the years. Perhaps is there an example that you can give where he's been through an injury process, the culture that he's been able to acquire throughout that process and then to come back even better and stronger and how that can rub off on the team? Were there scenarios like that? Yeah, I, I don't think I'm telling you anything that's not already out there. I mean, mm. he, he had one ACL injury and then injured himself within, I think, two to three games of being back. Um, which was just devastating, and that you know I, I know there's I think I recall um, three or four back to back um, in particular players in the Australian Football League. You know, so it's not uncommon. It's devastating when it happens the first time, and then when you spend nine to twelve months of your life. Um, giving it as much as you possibly can, all the effort in the world, all the eating right, taking the best advice, and then it happens again, mm. that pushes you to a dark place, right? Mm. And I saw Dave, I saw Dave go through that, um, and you know, an amazing individual. He just was. He was just, you know, typified resilience, and he maybe maybe he had a fantastic front for when he was, he was around the team and the squad and that sort of stuff. But I know he had moments where he had to pull on his inner strength and and get himself through. And there's such a strong character. I mean, his career's gone on to bigger and better things since he left rugby, which is really cool as well. But you know, he he would train harder than anyone else that was playing, and he made it his duty to go and make sure that other people in the team were well prepared. You know, he couldn't play, um, but he's you know that's what we talk about with culture groups, and it's that you know what a what what are your rehab players doing to make the squad better? You know, and a lot of our a lot of our guys have got so much respect for them. Mm. They'll they'll do everything they can to get the team back. You know, even though they're probably in a dark place and just want to be out there themselves. Eh? Mm. Mate, how do you measure the success of team culture in that rehab process? Like, are there indicators that you're looking for? Yeah, hard hard to put something hard to put something tangible on it, isn't it? Because I mean, every every player is so different. But you know, I look for how well a player is supported, how well they're included in team meetings, what projects they're given. You know, what can they actually do to support the group, support the organisation? Yeah. Um, you know, but we're not just sending them out for a bazillion promotions just because they're in rehab and they're busted and treating them like that. We're treating them as equal as anyone else. You yeah, know, and nice. they, they can't put the performance there on the pitch, but they can certainly do things off the field to me to lift things. So they've probably got a great eye for standards. You know, you walk walk through a building and there's a spare something over there, so they pick it up and they put it away. They've got this great eye for knowing what the standards should be and then how they should transfer onto field of play. So. It's an interesting question, right? It's like how much of that detail around off the field will actually transfer to us knowing the detail on the field. And I think it's quite high. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a person that makes their bed, puts their clothes away in the morning, irons the shirts, you're probably going to be the person that arrives on time um, has a pen and pencil to write their notes from the meeting. Is the same person that knows exactly what supplements are going to um, work for them on game day, and they're going to have them ready to go for a game. And they're also going to be the person that knows exactly their role um, at a particular breakdown on the field. You know, I, I just see so much transfer between <clears throat> detail off equals detail on. Mm. Isn't it good seeing some of these players return and they look even fitter and stronger and in better condition than prior? And and I always I think to myself, they've obviously been putting in the hard yards in the gym or in the areas that they can actually do. So whatever's in their control, 
they're going at it awfully well because they come back looking even stronger. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point, Mark. We had one guy in our um, our rehab league, he's got called Dave Wellington's election, and he got the guy called Tom Hooper, who your rugby mm. fans yep. would know is a bit of a bit of an up and comer. Um, Hoops, you know, he he had a nasty fracture in our trial, um, was out for about twelve weeks, and then hasn't missed a beat since. And he's gone on to play for the Wallabies off a really short run in Super Rugby. You know, so he didn't have that many games to prove himself. But if you get the rehab right, which the guys did in that particular circumstance, you know, he came back, took a game or two, and then he was up to up to international standard pretty quickly. And he's his career will go that way, yeah. um, you know, only because of the work he did and the, the detail he put in there early doors in his rehab. Hi, I'm Tom Green, Olympic champ from Tokyo. And if you want the best tasting protein bars on the market, you should try the new Body Science Moose Range. Greg, you better be testing those. Mate, they're getting drug tested. Got you covered. Yeah, Mate, impressive. do you find that the players and the people have a big uh, a big presence for the culture around a group of athletes in rehab? Like if you had David Pocock in... Um, Rehab, would you find that the rest of the players that were in rehab had stepped up, come back bigger and better from that experience? Or is it a very personal, unique thing in that space? Like it's it's me or is it us? It, yeah. Does that make I sense? I think we can me? even yeah. – yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it doesn't make sense. It makes good sense. It, it's, it goes back to your culture piece, right? It's like you know, how, how does a place – um, if you could somehow have a measure of culture, how does that become that? And yeah. if you look back through the age, you know, at some point, sometime, there was someone that was pretty special and then that kind of gets passed down. So, you know, where we are at the Brumbies, we had guys like George Gregan um, yeah, from exactly, 1996 yeah. onwards, really high standards, um, you know, drove it. And then he had people um, come in behind him. So a guy called Christian Lilifanu came in and he kind of took the baton and then he was now the keeper of the standard. So, you know, I remember the first time I ever strapped Christian. So strapping, as we were kind of talking about earlier, yep. and I put a, put a crease in his strapping tape or something like that. He kind of ripped it off. I was like, mate, you go and get better and then come back to me. And not in a, not in a arsehole kind of way, just yep. in a, so, mate, I'm going to, I'm going to give you some advice and it made me better. Yep. And then that's passed on to the next generation of people. And yeah, you know, we've got a great skipper at the moment who injured himself on the weekend oh, as well, yeah. but he's now the carrier of the, he's now the carry the torch right and then once you've got these leaders everyone's like that's what we're going for and then he'll look around and if the stand is not where it needs to be we've got a, a process of you know, challenge and support getting the, the care and the challenge just in that right balance yeah, and I, I think the, the club I'm at at the moment does it superbly well we had Alan Alautawa, yeah, that's who you mentioned. And I mean, yeah. it comes on running on skippering the Wallabies. Um, I think, what, second or third time ever skippering. Um, huge lead up, huge, huge hucker from the All Blacks. He hands over the boomerang as a sign of respect and it's all on. And, and next thing he's getting stretched off the field, you know, with was it a raptured Keeleys in the end? And of course, it's World Cup year. So, I mean, that must just be devastating for you, Byron, when, you, when you're watching this take. Yeah. It is, and you're yeah, you hit the nail on the head. What a how do your emotions go from you know leading your country out in front of eighty four thousand the MCG to knowing your World Cup's gone? Mm, yeah, you know wow. the thing you've worked you, four years for. It's like you know, put yourself in those shoes for a second. And you know, to his credit, you know, I, I kind of you speak to the guys, give him a bit of space, obviously, but speak you know a day within a day or so that kind of thing. And it's like man, perspective. You know, he's got mm. he's got two little babies, two mm. new babies, and this kind of stuff. So it's, there's a you know he sees a silver lining already. And it's like, you know, I'll spend time with my children and I'll come back better. And he can see that within 12, 24 hours of his injury. Wow. It's just incredible, isn't it? It's like, that is, you yeah. know, how do you do that? It's amazing. Like, they're, they're amazing. And I, I must say, Christian was incredible. So he went through a reasonably um, well documented process with his cancer. You know, returned return to play around the 12 to 14 month mark after being diagnosed with uh, myeloid leukemia. And, you know, I did his first session with him after, uh, you know, he'd been through you know, chemo and all these, all these different bone marrow transplants and that sort of stuff. And I remember his first session, it's like we were pushing two and a half kilogram dumbbells and we had to have three to four minutes break between a rep of six, this kind of thing. And it's just like, that is determination. <laughs> wow. You know, if you could bottle that up and just go, that's, that's unbelievable. And he made a, a good return to play, still playing to this day. It's just such a, those kind of stories, it's like, and everyone, everyone that's worked in sport for a long time would have that sort of story, but... Yep. It's, you know, it looks it looks like the sore hamstring, the sore lower back. Compared to that, it's like you know you're okay. Let's have some perspective. You know, like we're professional. They're professional footballers. We get paid to be in the sun, be around our mates. This kind of stuff. It's a pretty privileged existence, really. And that that kind of helps with that with that culture of you know we'll be back. They'll get back, uh, and we're just there to support them. And the support crew are there to love and care and, and push them hard. Really, isn't, yeah. that, isn't it nice to hear those words when you're talking about a rugby team? I know my you know, hair's on edge. My yeah, hair's standing it's like it's. It, I'm really engaged in what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Do you find a lot of these really high performers, and every team's got them? Y you've you've got to strap on that concern and that love you're talking about there, because they're more susceptible to emotional distress. Because you go from like you just said, like the journey back there, pinnacle captain. Yeah, and a, and a, the injury is 
devastating. And, and I mean, obviously, the year of the injury is, is even more devastating again. Is that, is that a real issue for you in that space? Yep. Yeah, it is. It's the um, uh, talk about Alan. I, had, I remember a guy I had in the UK, uh, international level player, uh, again, a ruptured Achilles. And uh, that was such a fight. We had issues and that sort of stuff. Uh, a fight in the sense that it was, you know, psychologically such a big thing. We had a World Cup in 2019 coming up. Um, he he kind of had a re rupture after about 12 weeks. So, you know, it's a big surgery. And then at 12 weeks, step back, boom, gone again. And so the process to get his confidence up um, to make a return to play was extreme. You know, like there was self doubt. Hell of a player. Like yeah. you're talking a guy running nine nine point five to ten meters per second, so it could really shift. Um, <laughs> you know, to get his confidence up, like we did different things. We took him, took him to tr- we took him to tracks, got him spikes. You know, just to show him different ways. So they're, they're, that, that kind of complex systems theory, right? So show him different tasks, changing the environment, just giving him different things to take his mind off the fact that his Achilles had been ruptured. He had no soreness. It was confidence. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's a, it's a really, really unique injury like that. You know, your bread and butter is pushing and driving and creating force through that calf and ankle. And, you know, that's had a huge insult. So being able to overcome that, and this is why you would see, you know, that's why it's such an amazing thing when guys get back to their best really quick. Mm. But, you know, for, for most of us mere humans, it takes a fair bit of time. Or, you know, the ACLs, it's probably 12 months before they're really humming and trust their bodies again. Oh. It's, a, it's a very normal thing, guys, yeah. It's that fear and trust, isn't it? That's massive. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Crazy. How, how would you try and assess, yeah, talk us through the, the you making the decision that it's time to go back on the field. Yeah, yeah good call. You're back in. Is that your decision or the yeah. athlete's? Some of the athletes, I don't know if any of them listen to this, um, but <laughs> I've, I like to think that I've never made a decision to send a player to train or play. Yeah. Do you know, my job is to show them the process to get there. You know, if I do it well, then the athletes, they buy in, they just trust there. So I'll never go, mate, you're playing today or you're training. I like to think I've never, ever done that in, in 15 years in it. It's like, mate, this is how we, this is how we could do it. And I've, I've turned around, been a part of some guys turning around some amazing things in very quick time. Um, also a shame to say that when you push things really quickly, there can be a cost. So the risk can be high. Yeah. Um, and you can get through a game, but then what do you look like three days later? Yeah. You know, so I'll push some things really quick. And you would, you guys would see that. I mean, um, Cooper Cronk a few years ago with the scapula. That was a quick, amazing turnaround. But there can be a consequence to that, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a balance. And as you experience and spend more time in it, you realize that, you know, step back from it. Is it really worth pushing this this hard? Um, we can do it. Um, and I think adrenaline is an amazing thing. You know, you, you talk about hormones and, um, you know, being able to get the balance right there. Um, but once someone's up and about and they want to play and they're white, so their reason for wanting to do it is super strong, that can override such huge amounts of pain um and then sorry just to just to round on your question there was what was that yeah yeah we kind of talked talk, talk, talk in circles a little bit there but i hope i kind of got somewhere yeah, just it. that final decision to actually be saying yeah. to the coach or saying to the player yeah yeah, yeah, yeah you're back in the team yeah. this for this game yeah so yeah i mean to, to give you an idea it's it's a process, right? So mm-hmm. if the end goal is to play an 80-minute game of football, what do we need to do within that? And then if we're going to jump, um, try and turn something around reasonably quickly, we want to have strategies in place to check and balance. So it's like, oh, I need him to look like this by Tuesday. So when guy gets injured mm-hmm. on Saturday, what's he got to be able to do Sunday morning? We recover hard. Um, we eat the right things. We hydrate. And then we that's just all, we, all we can do in that immediate post-injury process. And then what's the next 12 hours look like? What's the next 24 hours? What do I need to do Monday to know that I can do that Tuesday? What do I need to do Tuesday to know that I can do that Thursday? And then it comes down to context and the coach's um, willingness to give people as much time as possible to prepare themselves to be ready. But it's just a, we call it a regression model. Um, what they do in a game has to be reflected all the way back through from metrics around acceleration, sprinting, power movements, our strength in the gym. We've got a great great gym-based team here, you know, who are supreme in what they do. They could make decisions as I could around players, return to plays. But uh, a long answer to a short question, yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's yeah. very much a, a back and forward with the player. Yeah. Tied you up for a long time. Now we'll let you go in a minute. But I've got one more question. You seem very educated in this space and very passionate in this space. Are clubs sharing information with other clubs for the betterment of the athlete? And are, are other sports sharing information with you as well? Like, are you, t- are you guys working with the NFL, for example, and ice hockey and, and discussing the athlete at large? Or is it is it IP internally and it's part of you winning premierships and you having the best culture and the best rehab processes mm. and the best visions and missions in those spaces, which makes you a team that constantly, you know, you, you, you guys very rarely miss. So yeah. how's, how's it work? Yeah. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's a big thing we pride ourselves on, right? So hopefully you're feeling a flavor of, you know, driven, um, points of detail, et cetera, in the kind of way we talk. And that would be across, hopefully across the organization. So how we get better is largely, it's an internal 
internal bias to control. So yeah. each of us would be out there knowing what we need. So we're just in the review process from the season. Um, we reviewed really hard. You know, we finished with a semi-final, but there wasn't a lot of satisfaction with that. So we review, review our detail hard, review the things that went well, but also the things that didn't go so well. So we've got a couple of work on areas. Um, and, you know, I've got a fantastic, fantastic general manager of rugby here at the Brumbies who's, you know, we're going to suit the Soleil tomorrow night, for instance, to have a chat to those guys and understand, oh, that's cool. you know, how they perform. Because they yeah. perform. Like they, they can't have a down night because yep. people are paying their, paying their dollars to go and see them perform. So it's like, what's the, the psychology behind their ability to perform night after night? You know, how do they do that? Um, which is amazing. But sometimes you've got to look inward. Like, you know, I, I mentioned Laurie before. We've got, you know, Steve Larkham, our coach here, huge wealth of knowledge. Yep. So yes, I can go out everywhere and, and I love going out to different clubs and sharing information, particularly in the concussion space as you probably picked up. But I'm yep. um, learning learning how the swans do it or um, the roosters do things. But, you know, there's sometimes you've got to look inward. You know, I've got some of my mentors are from different parts of the world, business. Um, I learn a lot from them about leadership and, you know, how they get the most out of their people. So it's sometimes it's 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 right in front of you. You just got to open the eyes. You, you touched on the semi final loss. I mean, yeah, 6 19 mm-hmm. to the Chiefs. Nothing to be ashamed of there. It was a top season. The quarterfinal win over Hurricanes, massive, right? 37-33. I mean, big season and, and you'll be looking to go a couple better next season. Yeah, yeah, certainly. That's um I think, you know, you see opportunity, right? And this is we're storytellers. There's people that work in and around it. The story is, you know, we're gonna come back from a World Cup, there's gonna be an exodus of those New Zealanders. Hopefully they're they're all signing elsewhere. So it's an opportunity for us to, you know, do better, um, compete hard with them, beat them, and then we roll from there but yeah we weren't satisfied with where we got to you know we, we wanted to be better than that and that's through everything right we're going into a couple of cool years in rugby with the Lions series and then the World Cup after that so you know the Brumbies as a province wants to produce more Wallabies um, more more great people and then you know, bring through our own people from our system as well so we've got we've got some lofty goals yeah good and I think the health of rugby union in the country is on the up seeing almost 84,000 at MCG so that must have made, made you feel proud also yeah it was a cool moment wasn't it mm. I know I mean I've seen the I've seen the other side as well when it, when it mm. hasn't been so healthy and you know performance will return I don't know I don't know what you guys think but it's like you know I thought they played well in pockets you know they just turn oh, yeah. that on for more minutes more yeah. minutes and they'll you know they'll go well it's um I think the wheels are there um it's, it's a, a bit of a strange thing to see you, you know see it in rose colored glasses because we've still got work to do but Oh. You know the the shoots the shoots of growth are certainly there at the national level, and then you know we've just got to keep performing where we are down here. And you know I appreciate the support from you guys um, in what you do and what you provide the Brumbies as well. So every every tiny part of the program um, gets us to where we want to be um, on the on the biggest stage. Huh? That's really good to hear. No, we yeah. love it. We love it. Byron, I think we could talk to you all day, mate, but you're a busy man. I think we should, what are we, we're about over 40 minutes, so I think that's a fair podcast. That's a good, yeah. that's good. I've enjoyed it, I've Byron. enjoyed that, mate. Yeah. I, you, you're one interesting person. And, um, I appreciate thank it. Thank you for your time. I'm really appreciative. I love I love being with the Brumbies. We've been with them for ages now. It's one of our long-term teams, which, you know, as a as a, the founder of the brand is something that I'm very proud of and to have the caliber of people like you, you know, as part of our family is just something special and thanks mate. That's all I can say. No. Hey guys, great to, great to be on board and I look forward to listening to a few more podcasts down the track. Mm. They're brilliant. So thank you. <laughs> You're a legend. Thanks. thanks Byron. Take it okay. easy. Cheers. Cheers.